the Vancouver Grizzlies select Steve Francis. From the this is a great day for basketball in British Columbia and for Vancouver Grizzlies basketball fans. It's my pleasure to introduce to you at this time Mr. Michael Heisley of Chicago, Illinois, the future owner of the NBA Vancouver Grizzlies. When the Memphis Grizzlies donned these retro threads, basketball fans of all ages swooned. Who doesn't want one of these turquoise bad boys? But behind those Vancouver era Grizzlies jerseys lies the story of the worst franchise in NBA history. This is the story behind the Vancouver Grizzlies. Valentine's Day 1994 was a special one for Vancouverites in love with the game of basketball. Only a few months after the NBA announced its Canadian expansion to Toronto, Vancouver got a team of its own. The Grizzlies, who were originally set to be named the Mounties before running into licensing issues with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, began play in the 1995-96 season. To build the Grizzlies from the ground up, ownership hired Stu Jackson as general manager a former coach who would later go on to become the NBA's Senior VP of Basketball Operations. Jackson made free agent guard and current Pacers general manager, Kevin Pritchard, the Grizzlies' first official signing, though he was later traded without ever suiting up for the team. Vancouver then picked up Greg Anthony and Byron Scott, among others, in the 95 expansion draft. For their first foray into the actual NBA draft, both the Grizzlies and Raptors were hampered by a ridiculous NBA rule that prevented the two expansion franchises from selecting in the top five that year. More on that later. Anyway, in the 95 draft, the Grizzlies were behind the Timberwolves, who chose a lanky teenage big man named Kevin Garnett at number five, and one pick ahead of the Raptors, who selected future rookie of the year Damon Stoudemire. With the sixth pick, the Grizzlies selected Oklahoma State's Bryant Big Country Reeves. With the sixth pick in the 1995 NBA draft, the Vancouver Grizzlies select Bryant Reeves from Oklahoma State University. It's easy to laugh at that pick in hindsight, especially given how quickly Reeves' body gave out on him during his six-year NBA career. But Big Country entered that draft as a legit seven-footer who averaged more than 21 points and nine rebounds in leading the Cowboys to the Final Four. And for a brief few days at the start of Vancouver's inaugural season, it looked like Reeves might have found himself in another winning situation, as the Grizzlies started their inaugural NBA season with a couple of wins over Portland and Minnesota. Except here's the thing, the Grizzlies then lost their next 19 games, and Vancouver wouldn't make it back above 500 at any time for a full five years. That first Grizzlies team also set a record at the time by losing 23 straight games, en route to a league worst record of 15 and 67. Now, usually that would translate to the best odds in the draft lottery. And in 1996, that would have meant the inside track on acquiring a generational talent named Allen Iverson. But remember that ridiculous rule that prevented the Grizzlies and Raptors from making a top five pick in the 95 draft? Well, it was actually much worse than that. On now to the rules, the lottery is a weighted system that gives the teams with the poorest records the best chance of securing the top picks. The teams draw for those top three selections. The remaining positions are slotted based on regular season records. Under the terms of their expansion agreements, the Toronto Raptors and the Vancouver Grizzlies will take part in the lottery, but neither is eligible for the first pick in the draft. The best either can do is the second overall pick. Therefore, among the 13 teams in the lottery, the team with the best chance of securing the first pick is Philadelphia. And it wasn't just the 96 draft where the Grizzlies and Raptors couldn't win the number one overall pick. It was also the 97 and 98 drafts. For now, we go back to 96, where the Grizzlies ended up with the number three pick and selected future all-star Sharif Abdur-Rahim. The earliest a freshman has ever gone in the NBA draft, Sharif Abdur-Rahim. As solid as Abdur-Rahim was for Vancouver, his lone all-star appearance came years later while playing for Atlanta. At the time his name was called in the 96 draft, some of the guys still on the board included Kobe Bryant, Ray Allen, and a British Columbian native named Steve Nash. 
The Grizzlies trudged on, continuously inventing ways to lose during the season, then shooting themselves in the foot come the draft. They somehow managed to do worse in season number two, going 14 and 68 in a tumultuous campaign that saw Jackson come down from the front office to coach after firing Brian Winters. But you gotta keep your head up. You know, that's one good thing you can say about the Grizzlies, even though they've got a 15 game losing streak going here. Now these guys are coming out and playing hard every night. A year after the league worst Grizzlies had to watch the Allen Iverson lottery unfold without a hope of landing him, the 1997 draft season proved even more painful, as this time, it was the Tim Duncan sweepstakes that the last placed Grizzlies had no chance to win. Vancouver settled for the number four pick, which they used to select Antonio Daniels, who went on to average less than eight points per game in only 74 games for the franchise. Jackson hired Brian Hill, who had guided the Magic to the NBA Finals only two years earlier, to serve as new head coach, but not much changed. Sure, Hill's Grizzlies set a new benchmark for wins in a season, but that benchmark was 19. So three full seasons into the franchise's existence, the Grizzlies were on their second owner, their third coach, and had yet to even crack 20 wins in a campaign. Yet the worst was somehow still to come. The Grizzlies drafted point guard Mike Bibby to pair with Abdur Rahim, and there was some reason for optimism for the pair under Hill's tutelage. But any hope was quickly squashed during the lockout-shortened 1998-99 season, when the Grizzlies posted what was, at the time, the seventh worst season in NBA history, going 8-42 for a dismal 160 winning percentage that still ranks in the bottom 11 all-time. This is where Vancouver's draft failures become more self-inflicted wounds. With the number two pick at their disposal, and Bibby already in tow, the franchise made its biggest mistake by digging in its heels. Point guard Steve Francis, the projected number two pick, made it known he wanted no part of Vancouver. Baron Davis, Lamar Odom, and Sean Marion, among others, were still on the board, but the Grizzlies selected Francis anyway. With the second pick in the 1999 NBA draft, the Vancouver Grizzlies select Steve Francis from the University of Maryland. Now, usually I'm all for drafting the best player available instead of looking to fill a particular need, as you can always deal from a position of strength later. The Grizzlies didn't make that work either though. Before he ever played for them, the Grizzlies traded a disgruntled Francis in a three-team, 11-player deal. Vancouver acquired Othella Harrington, Antoine Carr, Michael Dickerson, Brent Price, and two draft picks that later turned into Matt Barnes and Marcus Banks. So much for dealing from a position of strength. As the team's ineptitude continued to reveal itself, so too did the organization's growing financial crisis. Between the lost revenue from a lockout shortened season and the realities of a business model funded by weak Canadian dollars but paying out salaries in American dollars, the Grizzlies started bleeding money. The first relocation scare came in 99 when Orca Bay Sports and Entertainment, which also owned the NHL's Canucks, struck a deal to sell the team to St. Louis Blues owner Bill Laurie, who in turn planned to relocate the Grizzlies to Missouri. The NBA, however, preferred that Vancouver get an opportunity to salvage its team, and Laurie eventually paid to walk away from the deal two years later. But by this point, the Vancouver Grizzlies were already all but doomed, on and off the court. They were a historically terrible team that wasn't getting enough out of the draft, and certainly didn't get enough out of the Francis trade. They burned through two more coaches in the 99-2000 season after Lionel Hollins took over for Hill, who was fired mid-season, then himself was fired after only 60 games on the job. The Grizzlies also once again lost 60 games. Between the lockout, the Francis fiasco, and perennial futility, a once promising fan base started to erode. The Grizzlies went from solidly average attendance through their first four seasons to bottom three in season number five. The 2000-2001 season was dominated by the drama of an on-again, off-again sale of the team. Once Laurie pulled out of his bid to buy and move the Grizzlies to St. Louis, American billionaire Michael Heisley stepped in and bought the team for $160 million. At his introductory press conference, Heisley played the part of franchise savior. I intend to do everything in my power to make this franchise a success in Vancouver. In reality, Heisley was already on the hunt for an American market, 
claiming that he projected $40 million in losses in his first season in Vancouver. If I'd analyzed the situation in Vancouver the way I analyzed all the other businesses I've had, I never would have bought them, Heisley said in 2011. Local fans started a Save the Grizzlies campaign to find a Vancouver-based owner who could buy the team from Heisley. Heisley later claimed he offered a 30% discount to local interest, but none materialized in time. Just two months after stating his intention to keep his new sports toy in Vancouver, Heisley announced that he'd chosen Memphis as the team's new home. A few weeks after that, on April 14, 2001, the Grizzlies played their last home game north of the border. They finished that season 23-59, which somehow represented a franchise best. So I guess you can say they saved their best for last, or something. Through six seasons in Vancouver, the Grizzlies posted a wretched record of 101 wins and 359 losses. Grizzlies stubbing her toes so far coming out. Three turnovers. Three turnovers, three possessions. That's tough to do. During that time, the team owned a winning record for a grand total of 21 days. They never finished better than 11th in the Western Conference or closer than 17 games behind the West's final playoff spot. What market? What franchise can survive that level of spectacular failure? Adding insult to injury, or rather relocation, was the fact that just a few months after that final game in Vancouver, the Memphis Grizzlies drafted a Spanish big man named Pau Gasol with the third pick in the 2001 draft, and within three seasons had constructed a 50-win playoff team. The people of Vancouver deserved better, but there's no one guilty party to point the finger at. Their short-lived NBA team was done in by unstable ownership, an incompetent front office, the league itself putting up roadblocks to early draft success, and all right, maybe a little by Steve Francis's unwillingness to play there. It takes a village to raise a franchise. It turns out, it takes almost just as much work to build the worst basketball franchise the NBA has ever seen. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button.